We continue our study of uh, linear functionals, linear operators, linear functionals, and uh, today we prove one of the most important results in this course. So this is one of the three, let's say, working horses of the functional analysis. So these are so useful and so powerful results that plenty of other results proved based on these three. So today we will go with one of them, which is called the Hahn-Banach theorem. So let me state this theorem, and then we will discuss the preliminary results, auxiliary results, which we need for the proof. But let me state it first. So let us start with uh, a linear space, no norm, no matrix assumed, so just a linear space over the set of real numbers. And let us consider on X a functional, which is not linear, but this functional P is sub-additive. Which means that p of x plus y is less than or equal to p of x plus p of y. And also, we want that this functional p is uh, positively homogeneous. which means that p of alpha x equals to alpha p of x for any positive alpha. For any alpha greater than zero and well, for every x and y from x. Well, in particular, any linear functional would satisfy both of these conditions with uh, equality over here and uh, not just, and uh, the second property holds for any alpha, not just positive, so for linear functionals. But we are not interested in linear functional. We are interested in a functional P which satisfy these two properties. And in particular, we have already seen the functional which satisfies these two properties. The norm on a space do satisfy this property. So this one is nothing but the triangle inequality for the norm, and this is what the positive homogeneity. So the norm in particular satisfies these two properties. Okay, so we have a linear space and a functional on this space. Let us further assume, let us further take a subspace Y of X And let us consider a linear functional on Y. such that it is dominated by this P. Which means that F of Y less than or equal to P of Y for every Y from Y. So if we are in this setting that this theorem claims that there exists A linear functional F bar on X. 
such that f bar of y equals to f of y for every y from y and f bar of x less than or equal to p of x now for every x from x so what does it mean that the functional well first of all the functional f is defined on y so it's a linear functional on y so this theorem claims that there exists a functional f bar on x, so on a larger space, such that on y, where f lives, the functional f bar coincide with f, so it is in fact an extension of this functional f from y to the whole space. And moreover, this extension also dominated by p as the original functional f. Well, the aim of the today's lecture is to prove this result. Before we go to the proof of this result, we need some auxiliary material on the partially ordered sets. We have, we have already discussed as relations on sets, and in particular we discussed the equivalence relation, so which is a specific type of relations. Now, I will introduce one more very specific type of relation, which is called the partial order definition. A relation I will denote it by this sign, which is usually used for less than or equal to, but I will use this notation for a relation. A relation on a set A is uh, set to be partial order if. So what do we want from this relation to be called a partial order? We want it to be reflexive, first of all. Which means that A is related to A for any A. This property is similar to the equivalence relation. Also, we want it to be anti-symmetric. Which means that if A is related to B and B is related to A, then A equals to B. For any A and B. And the third one, we want transitivity. Which means that if A is related to B and B is related to C, then A is related to C. If we have a relation on a set A which satisfies these three properties, we call this relation a partial order. Well, you won't be surprised if I tell you that a set with a partial order is called the partially ordered set. Or, sometimes, it is abbreviated to a poor set, partially ordered set. Well, let's get this definition a bit more concrete by considering some examples.
So the first example is uh, let's take the real line and the usual less than or equal to relation on it. With the usual relation. Well, it's not difficult to see that all three properties satisfied. So, in fact, every element is less than or equal to itself, and so on. So, this notion of the partial order is the generalization of this order on the real numbers. Let us go for something more substantial. So, let let S be a set and let P of S be the set of all subsets of S. Or in other words, sometimes it's called a power set. On this set P of S, I will now define a partial order in the following way. So for two elements from P of S, we say that A is related to B. So these are just sets. So if over here I used less than or equal to as the usual less than or equal to between two numbers, then over here it is just a notation. And I will say that A is related to B if a is a subset of B. Again, it's easy to verify all three conditions of uh, the partial order. It's in fact any set is a subset of itself. If a set A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, then they equal to each other well, and the transitivity is also straightforward. So this relation is also a uh, partial order. In this example, we can see why it is called a partial order. So for instance, in the example one, if we take any two elements, then they are comparable. So any two elements are related to each other. So any two real, if we have uh, two real numbers, then we can definitely say that either one of them is less than or equal to the other, or another way around. But in this example, not any two sets are comparable. We can easily find two sets such that neither A is a subset of B, nor B is a subset of A. So there are some elements for which are not related to each other at all. So this is uh, the root of uh, the word partial. So not every two elements are comparable, but some of them are comparable. And uh, as a last example, let me mention uh, the partial order on the space of sequences. Let be the space of all sequences. So for any two sequences, x and y, we say that we define the we define the relation. We say that a x is related to y if x k is less than or equal to y k for any k. So if they, if the sequence x is less than the sequence y in every single coordinate, then we will say that they are related, or the natural way to say that x is less than or equal to y. Again, it is um, not difficult to construct two sequences which are not related to each other. For instance, the sequence 1, all zeros, and the second sequence is 0, 1, all zeros. They are not related to each other. 
But again, it's not difficult to show that this relation satisfies all three properties. So it is a partial order. Let me write down a few more definitions from the reality of the partial order sets. So let A be a poset. Now, in a partially ordered set, I want to define the notion of a totally ordered set. A set B from A is called totally ordered if either A related to B or B related to A for any A, B from this set. Well, a simple example of this one. So if we are in an arbitrary linear space, then uh, we can take a span of a single element which is a one-dimensional space, but in this one-dimensional space every element is determined by a scalar. And so any two elements from this one-dimensional space are <coughs> comparable, so this is a totally ordered set. What we also want to define is an upper bound of a set. An element A from A is called an upper down of a set B if B is related to A for any B from B. Again, if you will think about the usual real line, it's not surprising. One more notion, which is also not very surprising. An element A from A is called maximal if A related to B implies A equals to B for any B. So it is maximal if, well, we can find an element which is not less than A than they equal to each other. And now let me state the result which is uh, called the Zorn Lemma and which is the key ingredient in our proof of the Hahn Banach theorem. Zorn's Lemma. So let A be a partially ordered set. So this statement tells us that if any totally ordered subset of A has an upper bound then A has a maximal element. Well, the proof of this lemma is way beyond the scope of this course, so we will not prove it. I will just mention that this lemma is equivalent to the axiom of choice. So axiom of choice, I will not state it. Uh, axiom of choice is uh, a very abstract result. Well, this one is also very abstract. There are very peculiar consequences of the axiom of choice. For instance, 
We can take a sphere, like a sphere, of the radius one, the unit sphere, split it into several parts, and out of these parts, construct two spheres of the same size. And moreover, there are not many parts in which we split this sphere. It, there are, in fact, only five of them. So the number is not even. So this is called the Banach-Tarski paradox. Well, mathematically speaking, it's not a paradox. It does not contradict anything. It's a paradox to our real-life experience. So if you are interested in that, well, you can, you can search it. There are dozens or, well, thousands of videos on Banach-Tarski paradox, some of them with very nice animation. Let's go for the proof of Hanbach. Suppose that the subspace Y does not coincide with the whole space X, because otherwise we are done. So we have a subspace functional on them, but if x and y coincide, we already have the functional f defined on the whole x. So we suppose that x does not equal to y. Then there exists x naught from x which does not belong to y. Let me now take two elements from the subspace Y, Y1 and Y2, and for them, let me consider F of Y1 minus F of Y2. Then I will use the linearity of F to write it as F of Y1 minus Y2. From the assumption of the lemma, we know that f is dominated by p on y. So uh, y is a linear subspace, so y1 minus y2 is still in y. So it is dominated by p. Now, let me add and subtract y0. And now I will use one of the properties of P, the first property sub-additivity. So this one is less than or equal to P of Y1 minus X0 plus P of minus Y2 minus X0. I cannot factor this minus 1 because the functional is not homogeneous, it's just positively homogeneous. Let me now rearrange this inequality to bring all the terms with y2 to the left, all the terms with y1 to the right. Minus p of minus y2 minus x0 minus f of y2 less than or equal to p of y1 minus x0 minus f of y1. And this is true for every y1 and y2 from y. In particular, I can take the left-hand side and take the supremum over y2, over all possible elements from y, and it is dominated by some number, well, the, the, the finite number. Or equivalently, I can take the infimum of the right-hand side, and it is dominated from below by a number. Setting. little m of x0 to be the supremum of this expression <laughs> mm. 
over all the way to from y. Well, yeah, I can just, it doesn't matter whether we write this index 2 or not. So that's the same expression anyway. So I've taken the supremum over the left, of the left hand side, over the whole y, and also I will take the infimum of this expression. again over the whole subset y. As I have just explained, both of these numbers are finite. And moreover, the little m is less than or equal to the big M. So in particular, I can find at least one number between two of them, and I will fix it. Well, it can be many are not like this, but uh, we definitely know that there is at least one. Let me now denote by y prime a direct sum of y and uh, the span of x naught. Well, this is still a subspace of x. Well, in particular, we have that for every little y prime from uh, the capital Y prime, there are unique element from y and the scalar such that y prime equals to y plus lambda x dot. Well, this is by the definition of the direct sum. So we have extended our initial subspace y by a one-dimensional subspace. And now I will extend the functional f, which is defined on y, to a functional on y prime. So first of all, any element of y prime is of this form. f of y plus lambda times r naught, that one which I fixed over there. Well, first of all, it is well defined because y prime is a direct sum of these two spaces, so this representation is unique. So it is, first of all, it is well defined. Since little f is linear, and by this definition, it is easy to see that f prime is linear. And also, let's, let us note, by construction, f prime of y equals to f of y for any y on y. So it is in fact an extension of the functional f to a larger subspace. Let me show that this extension is still dominated by p. In particular, it means that f prime is dominated by p on y. That's because it just equals to f, and f is dominated. So now I will show that f prime is dominated by p on the larger space y prime. So in particular, I can assume that lambda is not zero, because if lambda is zero, I am, we are, in y, and we already proved the inequality here. So we can suppose that lambda is not zero, and moreover, I will assume that uh, lambda is greater than uh, that. I will assume that lambda is positive. The case when lambda is negative is uh, exactly the same. 
we have that R naught is less than the capital M, which is the infimum over all Y from Y. And instead of taking infimum, I will take the value of this expression at a single point. So it is less than or equal to the value of this expression at the point y over lambda, which is an element of y because y is a subspace. So I, just I, I have just taken a value at a single point instead of taking the infimum of all elements of y. Hence. Now I will use the fact that P is positively homogeneous and F is linear and moreover that lambda is greater than zero. So I can factor out 1 over lambda from here by linearity, from here by positive homogeneity and multiply it through by lambda. Now let's rearrange it to get that f of y plus lambda r naught less than or equal to p of y minus lambda x naught. But this is, by definition, is nothing but f of y prime and this is p of y prime when I'm writing it over here, it's plus here, plus here, plus here, and plus here. And this in particular tells us that f prime of y prime less than p of y prime for every y prime from the capital y prime. Which means that we have extended our functional from the space y, from the subspace y, to a larger subspace preserving all the properties which we want in the statement of the theorem. It can happen that this new y prime coincides with the x. But then we are done. We have proved the theorem. What if they do not coincide? Then we can take one more point which belongs to x but do not belong to y prime and extend it to a larger space larger by one dimension. What if that new space coincides? Then we are done. What if not? We can again extend it by one more dimension and one more and so on. If this process stops after finitely many terms, then we are done. If not, then we have infinitely many extensions. Let, it, let us denote by F all such pairs. Fancy F, you know it by fancy F, the set of all pairs I will call these spaces F and H. So the pairs, the elements of the pair are F and H. Where F is a subspace of X such that it contains Y and H is a linear functional on F. such that H restricted to Y equals to F. The elements of the fence here are pairs where the first element is a subspace which contains Y and the second element of the pair is a linear functional on F which is extension of this little F and also we want 
that this H is dominated by P for every X from F. There are infinitely many elements in this set F, fancy F. Uh, let us define a relation on this set F. So first of all, the elements of F are pairs. So we say that a pair F1, H1 is related to the pair F2, H2 if F1 is a subset of F2 and H2 is an extension of H1. Which means that H2 restricted to F1 equals to H1. It is not difficult to show that this relation is in fact a partial order. It's not difficult to verify that it satisfies all three axioms. Well, which means that the set fancy F is a partially ordered set. Let us now consider a totally ordered subset in this set. Let G, which will be a collection of pairs F alpha H alpha for some alpha from the set I. We don't know whether it's countable or not, so just some set I just some collection of pairs. So we take G to be a totally ordered set. So we have considered an arbitrary, totally ordered set. Let's construct an upper bound. So let us take F to be the union of all F alpha over all alpha from this set. And define H on F, which will be a linear functional, well, a functional which will be linear. So we define a functional such that H of X equals to H alpha of X for every X which belongs to F alpha. So we define a functional on this union of the sets in a way that we take a point, by definition, since F is a union, then this point X should belong to some F alpha. For that F alpha, we take the corresponding H alpha and then find the value of this H alpha at X and set our new functional H to be that value at X. It is uh, not difficult to check that this functional is, uh, first of all, well-defined, and second, it is linear on F. By our construction, we have that. F alpha, H alpha is related to F H for any alpha from I. So any element from our set G is related to F and H which, which we constructed like this. 
if you'll have a look at the definition of relation, then it will be pretty much straightforward. So this functional H is defined on a larger set, on the largest set, and it is a restriction, by definition, restriction of this functional to any F alpha is coincide with H alpha, by definition. But this means that <clears throat> this means that this set G has an upper bound. So we have found an upper bound for this set G. But G is just an arbitrary totally ordered set. So we have not specified anything about G. So we have just proved that any totally ordered subset of F has an upper bound. So we can apply the sort lemma. By Zorn lemma, the whole set F has a maximal <coughs> element. Has maximal element. Let me denote this maximal element. by F infinity H infinity. So hence we have extended F from Y to H infinity, we extended F on Y to H infinity on F infinity. Let me just mention the properties, so which means that H infinity restricted to Y equals to F. So we in fact extended it. And moreover, since F infinity H infinity is still an element of the set F, we have the, this functional H infinity is dominated by P on F infinity. So this is the kind of functionals we want. The only question is, is it true that F infinity coincides with X? So again, if this huge space F infinity coincides with X, then we are done. So we have extended the functional to X in fact. But what if not? If f infinity does not equal to x, then we can find an element which is in x but not in, L, uh, in f infinity and extend a functional from f infinity to f infinity plus one dimensional. H infinity to H infinity prime on F infinity direct sum with the span of sum X naught. Let me call it F infinity prime. What do we have here? F infinity prime is larger than F infinity.
and h infinity prime is an extension of f such that h infinity prime is dominated by p for every x from f infinity prime which means that the pair f infinity prime h infinity prime belongs to the set f moreover by definition f infinity h infinity is related to f infinity prime h infinity prime but f infinity h infinity is um, the maximal element so in this case they should coincide but they do not which contradicts the maximality of this element. We have assumed that f infinity does not equal to x and ended up with a contradiction, which means that f infinity equals to x and we are done. In the next few lectures, we will see how this Hanbanek theorem can be applied in various situations to solve various problems. But today, let me finish the lecture with one application of the Hanbanek theorem, uh, which, is, uh, which will be the construction of extended limits. So let us consider the space of all bounded sequences and the subspace of all convergent sequences. Is there a nice linear functional on the space of all convergent sequences? So, well, if the sequence converges, then we can say that the limit exists. The limit is a linear functional. Yeah, we can see that the real value sequences. Let f be defined by f of x equals to the limit of xn n to infinity well where x is a convergent sequence so the limit is defined the limit is a linear functional what I want to do now is uh, I want to extend this functional from the space of convergent sequences to the space of all bounded sequences to do this, I need a functional p, which is not linear, but which is sub-additive and uh, positively homogeneous. So I will take p to be lim sup. It is not difficult to check that this functional is in fact sub-additive and positively homogeneous. So these both are the properties of supremo. We have 
the f of x less than or equal to p of x for any element from C. So for any convergent sequences, over here we just have limit, over here we have lim sup, but the sequence is converging, so it's a limit as well. So they are equal in fact. Hence, we can apply the Hahn Bonnet theorem. This functional f extends to a functional f bar on L infinity such that well, such that they coincide for any convergent sequences and L bar is dominated by P which is Limsu. And so this functional F bar is called extended limit. Or rather, I will write these because the extension is not unique. are called extended limits. And as an exercise for you, uh, carefully analyze the proof of the hahn bonnet theorem and prove that there are infinitely many extended limits.